All right. Uh, my name is George Bunkenbeck. I'm the Islip Town Historian, and uh, we're going to try this online tonight. What we're going to talk about is that some of these things in the historic collection of the town of Islip. 300 years ago, the residents of what would become the town of Islip, which at that time was the precinct of Islip, got together and had a meeting at a store in Islip Hamlet. And from that time on, they maintained records. Now, we do have some records that predate that, but we're going to look at tonight at some item, items that uh, tell a little about how people lived in the town of Islip, some of the things that we have that describes what life was like back then. To help me tonight, I've asked two people from the town clerk's office to join me. And uh, over here on the, on the computer watching your comments, then you can comment and ask questions. Uh, we will welcome them, and we're going to ask you some questions. Is Chris Albergo. He's the assistant to the town clerk. Hello. Chris's job is to catalog, assess, and basically get documents ready so they can be found and used by people for research and for our own research for the town. We also have here Charlene Millian St. Pierre, uh, who doesn't like to be on camera, but Charlene is our uh, person in charge of preserving the documents, keeping them in excellent shape, and ensuring that what needs to be preserved is preserved. So, with that in mind, let's get started. We have a question for you, and that question is, when was New Year's Day in Islip Precinct when the first annual meeting was held? And the multiple choice will make it easy for everybody. January 1st was A, B is March 25th, C is June 21st, and D is September, uh, December 25th. So think about that as we start off. One of the problems that we have, and one of the difficulties is in not only transcribing and interpreting these documents, but their condition, and I, I'd like to ask the two people that deal with the conditions of the documents and making sure that they're properly cared for to discuss some of the challenges that we have with these documents. So oftentimes these documents are quite fragile and difficult to handle. When we first get one of these old documents in, we have to really look at it and make sure that it's going to be okay when we handle it. We try to never work with the originals. Instead, we like to use photographs and work with those. In the future, we hope to be able to have a full flatbed scanner so we can totally put every single document in the scanner and we'll be able to keep them safe and perfectly fine when handling them. Anytime an original document is handled though, we use cotton gloves or latex gloves to protect our hands because your hands have oils and many dirty chemicals and stuff and we don't really want to be touching these old documents with them. We could really damage them. There are times when also we must wear masks because there are a lot of dusts and really gross things that sometimes are on these documents because they're very old and you don't want to breathe it in because it can cause you to get some type of allergic reactions and it made it very difficult for you. So definitely always wear a mask. The paper, ironically, many documents that are over from 100 or 200 years old are actually in better shape than newer documents because they were written on parchment or rag paper, both of which are lower in acid content. Like modern wood pulp paper can become brittle or even disintegrate over time as they are a high uh, acid content. And then one of the other things we noted is handwriting and legibility. These documents are both amazing to look at because the penmanship is just beautiful sometimes, but because of how ornate it is, sometimes it makes it quite difficult to read, especially coming from modern times to where handwriting's changed quite a bit. You look at some of these words and you're like, I. I no idea what they're trying to say. So you have to do quite a bit of research to fully transcribe and understand what is being actually conveyed. As well as we've even had to use magnifying glasses to amplify and have it better so we can properly view it. There have been times when some words we've seen unique letters used because of the style of handwriting has just made it way too difficult to look at. 
And also, spelling and abbreviations makes transcriptions, though, both an adventure as we've been able to uncover certain words that we never thought because of the different abbreviations and styles of writing techniques of that time period. Yeah, I think one of the things right here on the screen, you can see one of the problems we face. Uh, many of the, the, the handwriting back then, this is an S. It's an F without a line through it, and then the short S. So they use a long S, and they also will use a short S. And sometimes SS, like this is the word assessors, uh, the long S here, the, the double S I mean, sometimes is the Germanic B, which was in fractal writing. So sometimes it's a real challenge to figure out exactly what they're trying to do and then top it. Each person does try to come up with their own particular fancy style. Over on the uh, left side of the screen that is there is one of the documents that uh, is hidden in the town minutes. That happens to be, if some of you may have seen it in Newsday, that happens to be the famous uh, scandalous report. You can see the handwriting in that is not as good as the handwriting over here on the word assessor. And it could be because the person was either left-handed, forced to write with his right hand, or he didn't write things that often. And that, you know, there wasn't all that written communication. They would take notes and they would be sparing because it was a lot of effort to write with a basically uh, goose quill pen, and we'll talk a little about that later. May I ask Shirlene? So the slide that we're seeing now is basically um, notes taken from an old assessor's book or even probably even schoolwork. And all before 1830, handwritten documents were ink that were used, were written, were using quilt pen and iron gall ink. Writing with a quilt is almost like painting the writing on the page. Note as we see in movies where the person is pressing down, as we see today, the ink used was made from natural sources, mainly wood gall and iron oxide, and is therefore caustic. Over the years, the iron contained oxidized and fades out and often flakes off. About after 1830, the steel pen comes into use. Speed writing and new ink have had to be developed as it was found that the iron gall ink corroded the steel nib of the pen, which is the top of the pen, which I found out today. Um, as the 19th century progressed, new ink that were not corrosive also helped ink documents more easily, more easily read over a longer time. The dates as mentioned in the panels of the original town minutes, Britain and its dependencies used the Julian calendar well into the 18th century. Most of the rest of Europe and their colonies had long since shifted to Gregorian calendar. Often, especially in New York colonies, the date depended on the writer as there was still a large amount of influence by the Dutch in the affairs of business and state. We also must keep in mind that often dates were not as important to people, and there were people who did not know the date of their birth, as it was noted by at an event as such, were you born in the year of, you know, without a summer, and not a number, and that's kind of how people would recall their birthday. Moving along to Chris. So another concern that we had was uh, language and spelling and grammar. When looking at these documents, you would like to think that Yes, they are written in English. Well, kind of, and it was very different. It's not really our English, just per se, because over the years, English has added words and meanings have changed over time. So stuff from the 1800s to now is way different. So it requires some research to determine the exact meanings of some passages or excerpts. People often look at these old documents and also think that the idea that people weren't literate or they were terrible spellers or they were didn't have as much education as we do today when compared to us. But that's actually not true. Spelling in these do old documents makes it just difficult to determine what the word or the name is. The reason for that is in the United States, there was no standard for spelling. And until Noah Webster, as we know it now, the Webster's Dictionary, it wasn't published until later on. Or, and it wasn't standardized in Great Britain until way later on. So they didn't really have their own way of the English language that we go by it where you can just Google and be able to find out the actual word by using online. It wasn't like that. So to add to it, the writers often spelled words the way they were taught, which was at home by their parents. A lot of times homeschooling was their way of learning and understanding these 
words. So recent immigrants, or taught by recent immigrants, their spelling was often influenced by the person they were teaching or they came from. So wherever they came from, they were taught by that way. So it further complicated a lot of these things, and even further on, their capitalization was not standardized. It was often either whatever the person wanted to emphasize or followed older practices. This continued well into the late 19th century. In addition, English today, there's more than 26 letters, but actually it's 27 because the and sign or the ampersand sign is also considered a letter. Finally, yep. people just wrote and a document might have only one sentence. If you look at the first page of the 1798 supervisor letter, there's an example of a long document with few punctuation breaks in the writing. Formal grammar for handwritten documents did not exist as we know it. So when we actually looked at this document, there was oftentimes long run-on sentences, there was no real commas, so you were trying to figure out where the sentence ended and where the sentence continued. Yeah, there's some interesting, talking about dates, which Charlena talked to a minute ago, this is a page from the town minutes uh, where they're electing people. And this happens to be 1783 when the entire rest of the United States was recognizing the United States. Islip was still under British occupation. And so the minutes for the town of Islip during that time, or the precinct of Islip at that time, uh, were dated from the reign of His Majesty King George III. So he, you find some interesting things in there, but you'll also notice that if you look down the bottom of the page down here, where there's some ordinances that they put in, there is no such thing as a period. And we actually have a six-page letter written by the town to the state, which basically I think there's two periods in the entire letter. The entire rest of the letter is a single run-on sentence. So as we move along, um, the slide that we're looking at now is an actual um, picture of another assessment book from the 1869. The challenge is when it comes to protecting a document or an artifact, the challenge that we normally face to ensure that the document or the artifact will survive, not only is it our issue as we have noted, and the problem is its interpretation, but it must also be protected from fire, water, mold, insect, and be stored in the right type of storage container on steel shelving. All of that is a challenge when many permanent and historic dom documents are stored. The law requires that the retention of the original for many records, and so even if digitized or microfilm, the original still must be maintained. Many important documents are stored in fire-resistant cabinets, and the storage area is sprinkled. We also maintain an emergency kit just to ensure that any water or other issues can be addressed immediately. Yeah, this particular document here, uh, to show you how you accidentally can find something, uh, we were looking for a Civil War hero uh, who, is, who died in the town of Islip. And as we look through here, as, uh, well, we're getting this ready, and this will be going in for conservation next year. We noted here, David Ritchie is captain of, the, of a cutter and lived in Bayshore, had 30 acres. That was the first uh, confirmation outside some newspaper sources that he actually did live in the town of Islip. And that's talk about context. It's going to be at least another six to eight months before we complete the research for that, uh, for that particular person's history. We have a lot of records like that. Some of the record research on a simple record may take as much as a year. Uh, some of the ones that we are going to be producing as uh, online PowerPoint videos so you can see the details of some of these records. Uh, at least one of them, it's been five years in researching that particular single page document. So again, the context. I just mentioned it here, but the context is the same as a person. No one exists in a vacuum, so no document does either. This is the first page of the town minute book. These are the first minutes ever written for Islip. The precinct of Islip minutes, the first election held for officials in 1720. Uh, the transcription of this 
is only the beginning. Because we found out that this simple little document, after doing some research where it came from, produced 32 minutes of a documentary on this letter, this page alone, this one section of the town minutes, because the background of this is very much hidden in the very simple words here. Once you expand on it, it brought about an incredible background to the town, which has lain hidden for almost 300 years. Okay, um, got an answer here. Chris, did anybody send in any ideas or answers? Well, I'm having difficulty getting to the, the posts and discussions. Yeah, well, I'm sorry about that. We are having some difficulties with some of the stuff. We normally do this out of our own uh, our own lab, but that uh, or out of the 401. But we're doing it here at the library. So did you see any people that? We have one answer from. Oh. A.I. Ayob, which was, they put in A. They put in A. Well, January 1st is our New Year's Day. However, when Isla Precinct was formed, New Year's Day was March 25th, which is why all the patents and deeds say that the rent was due to the Crown on the 25th of March. So under the old calendar, the year started on March 25th. Now remember, Charlene had mentioned something about the dates. One of the problems with the dates is that when they did shift the dates over, they also had a year that only lasted three months. So therefore, I believe it's the year 1752 is very, very short. And then it becomes the next year, or 1751, but that's when they shifted over. The year wound up being short, and so March 26th became January 1st. So it, it gets really confusing. Here's the next question. Okay, so question two. When was the first time the town clerk wrote minutes for the town of Islip? Which was either A, 1720, B, 1753, C, 1788, or D, 1790? I'll repeat it one more time just in case the board can't really see. The question is, when was the first time the town clerk wrote minutes for the town of Islip? Again, it's A, 1720, B, 1753, C, 1788, or D, 1790? Next slide, please, George. Thank you, sir. So now we come to part three, which is as you can see, as it is titled, Barbecued Ribs Anyone? Isaac Precinct Fights a Feral Pig Problem. 1753 and 1757 minutes and subsequent minutes. Now I'm gonna read it as quoted in our minutes because this is quite the story, I think. It just goes to show you that even in times of today and then, you run into interesting problems that any town would not foresee. As quoted in the 1753 minutes, at the said meeting, it was voted and agreed on by all of the inhabitants that present that it shall be lawful for hogs that are well yoked to run freely on the common and that no owner of such yoked hogs shall be liable to pay damage for their trespasser unless the person or persons upon whom such hogs shall trespass, shall trespasses, shall be deemed to have a good and sufficient fence and further that no unyoked hogs shall be taken or impounded unless they are found or can be proved to have done damage in some enclosure, and in such case, the owner of such hogs to be liable, notwithstanding the sufficiency of such fence. What this means is, is, in 1753, is that they had an issue with wild hogs running around, and not only were they running rampant through the area, they were damaging people's property, and causing quite a ruckus by damaging fences, crops, and even harming sometimes livestock because wild boars and hogs, they are very aggressive. They're not like pigs. They're more, more docile and calm and very clean. They are very rowdy and dangerous. And as shown on the screen, this is what a yoking is. They would put this on a hog 
around its neck and it would prevent it, hopefully it would prevent it from damaging the fences by the way it was shaped and those pikes at the end would stop it from running through it. Again, I'm going to keep going because this problem kept going further and further on throughout the years because even in 1757, and as quoted, I'm going to read it word for word just so you all get an understanding of it. 1757 minutes goes on and it's, it is also concluded at the aforesaid meeting that the town act concerning hogs running on the commons is continued this year. Also, it is concluded at the aforesaid meeting that no boar shall run on the commons in the months of May, June, July, August, September, October, and November, and without any man having free leave to held the said boar and if the said boar shall die with the cutting, they shall recover no satisfaction by law. So again, noted once more, even in the 1757 minutes, which was a few years later, these boars and hogs are still running wild. And now they even needed to mention months of concerns with having it, trying to regulate and sort of get a handle on this. And even noted, with the castration to further curb the breeding of these hogs. So what castration is, is when they would remove the male genitalia of the hog to prevent it from breeding because they were breeding at such an exuberant rate that they couldn't control it. So the town was in way, way over their head with the, the hogs that they couldn't even wrap their head around it. And now we go into further, which is a recipe from Week's book and comments about pig contests. So going further with the wild hogs, there was even recipes on it because they had such an abundance, they decided to serve it up and cook it. So I'm gonna read you an excerpt from the late town historian George Weeks, as he mentioned in some of his Islip's early history. He had in his collection a staple card that is an advertising card for a staple run by Captain Samuel B. Gibson of Bayshore that had on the reverse side a recipe for curing hams by Dr. Mowbray. It was that to cure four medium-sized hams one would use, and this is an actual recipe for the ham, one would use four quarts of fine salt, four pounds of brown sugar, four gallons of water, and three ounces of saltpeter. Mr. Weeks also noted that it was common practice up through the 1890s for families having a large area of ground to raise pigs, and in the fall, a day was selected for hog killing time. So they started to make an event out of it to try and further curb it by creating it as a game. They would go out and hunt it to try and curb it even more. So they would castrate them and they would go out hunting to try and limit as many hogs as they could. Also, raisers who went out and wanted to uh, game, they would compete. The largest hog would often win prizes and would be rewarded for great sport. It would be killed, dressed, and then weighed. And then there we go, next slide. Yes, and the next slide, I'm going to ask Charlene to talk a little about eating. Thanksgiving and other holidays in Islip Town. As we, obviously, we had a lot of pigs running around. <laughs> and because of so, the kitchen, let's talk about the kitchen, ladies. One other difference that we have, that we are used to have in a kitchen in those times that was an integral part of homes, but earlier times, the homes might have two kitchens. One in a separate building, often referred to as the summer kitchen, which ladies, I'm sure we love that, which was used in warm weather to do heavy preparation of items for home, larder, and to lessen the heat in the home. There might be also another separate kitchen, or attached, or that was attached by what we would call a breezeway, or in the cellar that was the regular kitchen where the ladies would cook. The reason for the separate kitchen is that there were no fire departments until the late 19th century in Isla Town. So the kitchen with its hot fires and ovens was a very real fire hazard. Could you imagine? If one lost the kitchen, it could be rapidly replaced if there was a separate kitchen, right? But losing the house would be a serious blow to the home. And perhaps the community where homes were close together. So it was good to have two kitchens. We hope these notes and the recipes that we give you gives you a different view of the history and the historic sites of Isla Town. Also, in a letter sent to the state of New York on January 11th, as I quote, 1798, then supervisor Natalian Corklin gave a detailed description of the town that included a marine life, 
game and crops found within the boundaries of the town. And I'm going to read this. I'm going to quote it. From the Great South Bay and the Atlantic Ocean, he listed oysters, clams, geese, brants, ducks, snipes, and fish, particularly noting that the town's favorite was the sheep's head. The freshwater streams and palms were homes to trout and yellow perch. In the woodlands and fields were found woodcocks, plovers, rabbits, crews, porridge, and deer. On the, on the farmer, the inhabitants raised cattle, sheep, hog, poultry, and the grains to feed them. Every farm and village home would have gardens and often fruit trees, and there is evidence that there would be wild cranberry bog bogs in the town. In the latter part of the 19th century, the estate of the first Gold Coast and the various hunting and fishing clubs as an example, the Southside Sportsman Club raised peasants and other game birds for sport hunting in their estate of Orleans. So there was a large variety of ingredients available for the cook. So as we move along, let's see. We we have the um, answer to question two. Um, did, we, did, we, did we have any comments that answered that we question? We did not, but we do have a comment about a question, which I'm sure we'll get to later on after it's done. What, what is the comment? It is, uh, how did Sable get its name? How did Sable get its name? That's a good one. We'll, we'll hold that to the end. Uh, hopefully, we should be able to get to that, because it's a very interesting story. And it involves the Islip Town Supervisor slash Sable Postmaster slash <laughs> School Superintendent and only... Uh, teacher slash the presiding supervisor of Suffolk County That's a lot and of off time lawyer. It's a lot of slashes. <laughs> yes. A lot of slashes. And so the answer to question two was D. Night 1790. The date of 1720 was obviously the first meeting of the precinct of Islip. 1733 was a meeting of the precinct and 1788 was the state of New York named Islip a town of the state and surprising the surrounding towns. So we have a third question for everyone. And the third question is, what was the global pandemic disease that terrorized the 19th century? Not what's terrorizing us right now, but <laughs> in the 19th century. <laughs> so, go ahead. Okay, so part four, which would be, wait, we should probably read the questions to everybody. Those yeah, they may see. not be able to see them, so. So it's, um. Again, for the question three, it was, what was the global pandemic disease that terrorized the 19th century? It's either A, yellow fever, B, malaria, C, cholera, or D, swamp fever. I'll again say it one more time. What was the global pandemic disease that terrorized the 19th century? It's either A, yellow fever, B, malaria, C, cholera, or D, swamp fever. And now we can move on to... Uh, Part four, which was yeah, titled... They, if they pay hints. attention, they might actually pick a hint up. Yes, there are some hints for this one <laughs> in the next few slides. So if you're paying attention, you guys get it. Part four, which is a glimpse into 19th century home, Sarah's book. This is a book that we found in our record center. And unfortunately, we do not have the last name. It's only name that is in the whole entire journal is just Sarah. No last name. So sadly, we'll, we may never know, but we, we hope to assume that she's from the Nickel family. Now, she has a number of stuff listed in here, from household hints to recipes to remedies to insect stuff, anything that she could find, this is inside this journal. So the recipes are from, like I said, various sources and include an, even a recipe on pork. <laughs> so the book has clippings from newspapers and magazines on insects, such insects could attack the carpets, which now today we're not concerned about that because we have artificial rugs, but in those times they were using actual cotton and wool, so they were subject to infestation and damage. The insects would often start eating it and destroying the people now, so oftentimes the only way to fix this thing was to bring the carpet outside and beat it over the, with a whisk, a carpet whisk. So now going back to, if you think about the question again, today we are living through a pandemic as we find ourselves restricted in what we could do. 
now, you know, most of we're all at home during the COVID-19, we're in quarantine. But during the 19th century, they had their very own disease to deal with. And it was very prevalent, and it's sort of forgotten today, but it still happens sometimes. As way far out east came a disease that created terror in New York City starting in 1832. This killed hundreds of thousands worldwide and often killed you in, within hours, and no one knew what was the cause of it. It's interesting to note that in Sarah's book, she had numerous clippings on how to cure and possibly prevent what is now what is known what is now known as cholera. There's numerous clippings on this because this was a, what they did. They needed household remedies to figure it out because they they couldn't turn to doctors in these times to understand it. So oftentimes they would go to the newspapers and hope that there was a way to combat this. Now we know that the disease cholera was caused by bacteria strain, which was a person which was um, a wet born and created a situation where a person would die of dehydration. And New York City opened up and was completely empty due to this disease. And it depressed the United States economy for a number of years. So if you can imagine today, when you go into Manhattan and you see all the stores empty and Manhattan was completely barren during April when the pandemic was at its peak scare, that's what the, most likely New York City looked like in, 18, in the year, 1840s during cholera. People were afraid to even go out. So once clean water was introduced and proper sanitation and sewage was improved upon in the United States, that's what combats cholera. The main cause of cholera is improper sewage, fecal matter and stuff like that getting into your drinking water. That's how disease cholera often happens. But don't get me wrong, today is still a major killer in the world. It can happen anywhere. And next slide. And one settlement of the town allowed the residents to do more than just survival cooking. Meals that would have very large and evil, a simple evening meal might have, a, might have been a large production, especially in larger homes. For celebrations, the menus were often elaborate, again, especially in estates and manual houses. If one had the means, or even if one had to sacrifice, dinner consisted of more than one course if there were more guests, or later in the hotels and homes that took in hunting and fishing parties from the city. This was also true of large families gatherings, or if you hosted the annual town meeting at your home, or at one of the hotels or taverns in the town. Often these meals were a massive effort requiring days of preparation, including a slaughter of animals. And we obviously had a bunch of hogs running around. <laughs> Um, often these meals were for mass events and including harvesting whatever else were required as there was no supermarkets to go out to and pick up the ingredients. The woman magazines of the Victorian era gives us a glimpse of these different dinners, just as now where magazines, cookbooks, and the internet give us not only recipes, but also the menus for a perfect meal and even how to decorate the table and present the food. It was not uncommon for one of these meals to include a fish, a fowl, a meat course with appropriate side dishes. One of these meals could be challenged to a modern catering hall with fancy ovens and trained chefs, but the menus were prepared in fireplaces, ovens, stoves, with little way to determine the temperature, let alone keep a constant temperature. But let's see, as an example, as you see on this slide, the following suggested the menu that was a magazine of the 19th century as the perfect holiday dinner. As you can see, it was raw oysters. And note that raw oysters was a favorite part of the 18th and 19th century and meals in Iceland town was a major supplier of shellfish, especially in the 19th century. It was also boiled rockfish, stripped brass with egg sauce. Mm potato balls, roasted turkey with stuffing and gillet gravy, brown sweet potato, boiled squash, and cranberry jelly, sour grape jelly, molded spinach, um, hand-baked in cider, and garnished. Mince pie, pumpkin pie, fruit, and of course they serve coffee. The, the menu also included something called Higinia Sparkling Lithuania Water, 
said to be endorsed by the highest medical authority in this country and in Europe. According to an 1890s advertisement in the North American Journal of Homeopathy, basically, this was a mineral water that contained lithium by carbonite and was alkaline. So it would counteract acid stomach caused by the menu above. It came as still water or sparkling and it would appear to be really needed after a meal such as this, as you can see. Note also, only coffee was listed as a beverage. Depending on the home and the religious denomination of the family, there would probably be plenty of beer, wine, hard cider, and other alcohol beverages as part of the dinner and after. We do know that the hotel and boarding houses served alcohol as the licensing of these places was a major source of town revenue until the early 19th century as born out in the town's clerk or entry in the town minutes. Yeah, in fact, that's one of the comical things. Uh, when the state of New York realized how much money was being made from licensing alcohol, they went ahead and made it a state license. Islip Town actually voted, voted down the state licensing law until it was suggested a few weeks later to have a special meeting in that they couldn't vote down the state licensing law. And the town was very upset because it lost their largest source of revenue. And they had to come up with something else to pay for some of the bills. Now, George, when it said the highest authority in the country, was that the Surgeon General? Uh, the well, there was, though, right? there was a Surgeon General, but they were more interested in merchant seamen at the time. Uh. So the <laughs> highest authority was whoever they thought. Okay. They, so they used to, it, you talk about advertisings today, mm -hmm. back then they would lie through their teeth. So you would look at, that's why the newspaper clippings were so hold close to home. Yes. You would see these posts and you'd be like, I like this doctor. Well, and, and that's one of the comical parts we're talking about doctors. Um, the, uh, the 1798 supervisor's letter actually has it in that Islip was so healthy mm. that we only had one doctor. Well, in 1798, we had almost no citizens, so the, a doctor would starve to death if he had to, if he had to uh, serve the town because there's nobody there. And we'll talk a little about that in a few moments um, as uh, Charlene and all, uh, you want to talk about some of the, the recipes or how do you want to do that? You want me to talk about recipes or? Well, actually, George, going back to the doctor, I don't know if he would starve because of hogs. Yeah, He'd be true. able to hunt his own hogs. Could, yeah. they, they pay him off in hogs. Yeah. The person probably died of pork poisoning or something. Yeah, we're on a question uh, four, actually, four. George. Oh, we are? Okay. Yes. Did I not do that? Let me... I think it's the next... No. No, we're still in this section. I know what we did. Okay. This is the stuff that we didn't script. Oh, okay. So, we got some recipes for you out of Sarah's That's book. That's right, Ted. So... Head on it. I guess I'll, I'll do it. Yes. All right. Uh, there's a great Long Island folk song called Acres of Clams. Not only did we have a lot of pork, but we had, especially when the, the salt salinity of the bay changed, we had a lot of clams. The oysters were mainly in, in the creeks and in the uh, semi-freshwater uh, areas. But there were lots of clams. So there, in Sarah's book, there are a lot of recipes for clam soup, clam chowder, uh, baked clams, all sorts of pie. other things, and uh, clam pie, clam yeah, pie, which, yeah. by the way, is very good. Yes. And this is a recipe for clam chowder. Uh, if you would like this recipe, it happens to be on the town website in the history section. There's a historic book, which we, by the way, should go back through and correct some of the grammar and not to mention spelling. Yes. But uh, this recipe is in there as one of the recipes from Sarah's book. And of course, not only do you use clams, but you get to use pork, which again was prevalent. So much so they were drowning in it. And we did mention there had to be a recipe for pigs, and there is. I think that this is basically what the southerners would call chitlins. Uh, it's a fried pork where you cut slices of pork, you take it off and uh, after you fry it, you, you dip it in batter and of one egg and then put some more milk and a little flour on it, dip it in the fat again and fry to their brown. So uh, basically it's 
I know in Louisiana they sell it by the carload lots, so we had it here yeah. also. It's definitely not healthy, but I it was definitely probably really good. <laughs> well, one of the, one of the things that we forget is that we are very health conscious. However, back then, high fat foods were necessary because you were walking everywhere. That's true. Yes. You were working hard work, so it wasn't as bad as it sounds. Yes. No, for them, probably fine. For today's standards, I don't know if you would be wanting to dine on this every day. No, I, it, <laughs> uh, as some of you know, I'm a Civil War reenactor, and one of the one of the problems we had, we had done a, a movie and we were exhausted, and my daughter had cooked up one of the greasiest stews we ever had, and as you you ate it, you could actually feel the energy returning to oh, you. Oh wow! And everybody said that and they realized that we had just put in a day like they would normally mm -hmm. have done, which. Modern people can't do it, and, and again, you yeah, work, you work bread like they, when you work the land as hard as they did. That stuff would just revitalize them. Another thing we don't realize in the in the age of doctors and online medical, you can get your doctor on the on the computer screen if he knows how to use the computer. Uh, back then, mom was the doctor, and home was the hospital. The, there were very few, if any, hospitals. There were none here until uh, the late 19th century and early 20th century when uh, Dr. in Bayshore started working on, on putting together what became Southside Hospital. So the family would uh, happily collect all sorts of newspaper clippings or magazine clippings. For instance, as we were talking about cholera, over here is a letter from a doctor to his patients written in 1866 about how to prevent cholera. There were also uh, Mr. Squibb of the Squibb Pharmaceuticals who was in Brooklyn and he actually issued a recipe. Uh, I have the recipe. Today would it not only be banned by every Food and Drug Administration, uh, he also <laughs> said how much you could give a, uh, an infant, how much you could give an adult, and Cholera was very deadly. If you gave it this, it either killed off the cholera or killed off you. Either way, you went happy because it consisted mainly of alcohol and opium. Yeah, the only safe recipe that you can even Google it and you'd be fine to have is it's actually on Google. It's our simple throat remedy. Today, you can just Google it up as flaxseed tea. All you do is you boil a tablespoonful of flaxseed in one pint of water for an hour and you strain and add a tablespoonful of sugar and a juice of one lemon and you can either serve it hot or cold. Now this is actually will help soothe the sore throat. Yeah, this is better than what some of the doctors at the time were given because they were using turpentine. Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> well, it would clear your throat, probably kill you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here we have a whole thing about borax. If you had a burn and again in a farm, in a kitchen, uh, Longfellow's wife died of burns from cooking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here it is talking about using borax to soothe burns. Uh, here are diphtheria, again, a major killer of children. And she had a lot of diphtheria information as well as cholera in that book. Uh, nearsighted and farsightedness. Uh, I can remember my grandfather telling me that they, when he's a child, all he did was this all day, hoping that he would solve his uh, vision problem. And he was legally blind. He had glasses that were like Coke bottles. But again, this is the medical portion of the, uh, the sample of what's in that book. Another one, we forget that uh, everything was not synthetic. And therefore, everything could be eaten by something. Mm -hmm. Cotton, and they, they would have cotton rag rugs, they would have uh, other types of woven cotton rugs. They would have lots of the wool rugs. If you had a lot of money, you could have a wool rug. Uh, that's why you see in those old pictures, they always have somebody out there with a whisk beating a rug, not only knocking the dust out that would build up that we'd normally vacuum up, but also all of these nice little things that lived in the carpets. So these are carpet beetles. You could actually take this, this from a newspaper and you could happily sit there and check what was in your carpet against the paper to figure out what was coming into your home. Again, they did have some remedies. There was a, something you could buy at the local store which would kill off carpet beetles, but it also would probably kill off the pets and the people in the house because it was mainly arsenic. Yes. Keeping a clean home. No labor-saving devices at all. And you see over here, uh, this is uh, soaps and fluids for washing clothes, 
uh, one of the safest chemicals to wash clothes in is ammonia. <laughs> uh, again, soap re literally was made of fat yeah. and lye. Over here, they talk about washing flannel underwear. And to us it sounds funny today, but flannel underwear in the 19th century was extremely important because they thought it provided some sort of health protection. And I can remember my grandfather into the 1950s was that he was born in 1872, 1876, excuse me. He would wrap himself in a flannel around his middle because he said it was healthy and he wanted to know why the rest of us didn't do it. But again, different century and how to maintain the home. She had all sorts of hints on how to be a great homemaker. One of the things we did note in the book is that there are a lot of dessert recipes. So many. So many, yes, because meats basically were roasted in front of a fire or boiled or made into stews, things that could simmer over an open fire uh, or fried. There wasn't much you could do otherwise with meat. You might have a garnish and a sauce, but that would be a separate thing. But desserts, to prove that you were a great housekeeper, you had to have great desserts. So people would come to your home and a dessert, which may be several desserts at a large dinner, was an important part. And this one is for devil's food. And uh, it's, it is also, this one is also included in the printing, printed version that's on the town website. And we'll be coming out, we're working on trying to get some of these recipes modernized so people can actually try them. So I've got a couple cooks working with me. Anybody else is interested in trying to do something with it, let us know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's some interesting recipes in there that, you know, you read them and you're, you're eager to try it. Yeah, they're actually, there's some great also uh, summer drink recipes and things like that, non-alcoholic. Yeah, there's even, um, there's even an ice cream, I think, on there too. On yes. Like a quick ice cream. Yeah. Yes, quick, because back, anybody's had to make handmade yeah, ice cream. Yeah, yes, yep. Yeah. Not quick. That's, uh, your arm will fall off. <laughs> Question three. We gave you uh, what terrorized the 19th century. So... One person put in the end what they got it right. C. They put it in for C. Yes, and that's correct. And that's Palmer. Mary. Congratulations, that's Mary it. got it right. <laughs> so yes, cholera was important. Uh, all those other diseases, swamp fever was another way of referring to malaria at times. But malaria was present here. Yellow fever was in and out. It was mostly a tropical disease, but <clears throat> There was some problems here for periods of time during the revolution because it was brought up from the tropics with mosquitoes. Uh, but cholera ruled the 19th century. In fact, Chris and I are working on a research project off and on which involves, a, 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 in 1892, there was a cholera outbreak in New York Harbor. Yes, it was very bad and it got to the point where even um, from ferries docking at the famous Surf Hotel over on Fire Island, there were riots preventing, because the townspeople were that concerned with the outbreak that they did not want these sick people to get off the ship. That's how bad it was getting. Yeah, and, and it, yeah, because it was a waterborne disease, it, the town was worried that it would impact the shellfishing industry, mm -hmm. which was one of the major su suppliers of income to people in the town. Yes, so, so that's, that, was, that was the hub. That was that. That was right. Main and, selling crop, and the loss of that would have been staggering to the town. Question four. Question four. Okay. How did Iceland farmers fence their fields in the 18th century? A. Wood fences. B. Locked trees. C. Wire runs. D. Barbed wire. Remember, they had to protect their their areas from the hogs. So what do you think best protected their areas from hogs? I'd like to take a few minutes to look at something else that we're doing and have done. Um, there are a lot of things that people cannot see. There are historic buildings that very few people know are historic because they've been changed over the years. They may have a modern facade and it allows by building models uh, making three-dimensional views of the building in various scales, you can give people an idea of what's there. This is an example. 
over here, this is in Central Islip State Hospital uh, Cemetery. This is a common ground and the burials are over here and the Jewish portion of the cemetery is to the other side. This monument is kind of poignant because when you get up to it, you can see that it, even here in the model, uh, made sure it stayed crude, there is basically they etch things into concrete. This was made by the patients at the hospital, built this monument from concrete that they put together piece by piece in the cemetery. This, for many of the people in the cemetery, is the only recognition that they lived because they, because of state laws and, and worries about people in the time uh, with mental illness, they're identified only by numbers on blocks. Though in the uh, Jewish section of the cemetery, some of the families have been able to find and place memorials in there, and there are one or two memorials in the other section of the cemetery. There, thank, thankfully, the state of New York, the mental health uh, department, their volunteers from that department spend their weekends cleaning these cemeteries, and they've done a beautiful job at putting this together. We've run tours there over the, over the last five years. Um, and it, it still isn't open to the public, but when we did a display, which we included a model of the locomotive that used to work the railroad between all the state uh, uh, buildings, we also made a model so people could see something they could not see and get an idea of what it might have, what it looked like. So that's one example. Another example is that we did a very detailed history of life saving on the beach. There were three life-saving stations in the town of Islip, even though, uh, according to the according to the, the state, there is only one, Fire Island. But also, the next two stations were considered uh, Point of Woods and Lone Hill were considered part of the town of Islip by the federal government because that's where they crewed the, got the crews for the station. So over here, there was no way of, of having a photograph of the original Fire Island Lifeboat House, which was built in 1849. Fortunately, an 1848 exact version of this still exists in New Jersey at the highlands of the Navasink, where they've moved it off the beach. So we're able to have the prints of that done by the National Park Service. And we, made the or we found out that the regulations required windows at either end at the top, because in the New Jersey stations, Nobody could see anything in the attic, so they added that, and we believe that there was and may still be at, uh, uh, on the North Shore, one of these stations still exists. Uh, I saw it years ago when I was in the Coast Guard. I don't know if it's still there. This is what Fire Island Station looked like in 1872. Now, this particular one we have photographs of, so we know exactly how it was laid out. It was standard. In a short time, they extended this and put all sorts of things on it, and it eventually was completely rebuilt and lasted in, until the 20th century when it was torn down and they built a new one, and since then they've built a couple of other buildings. Finally, this station is the 1855 uh, version of what these original lifeboat stations supposed to look like. This is built from the records in the National Archives. We don't have a photograph of any of these stations. No one will know what the, knows what they look like. We do know what they said. So this is built from the items that are, we got from uh, various sundry sources on what the specs were like. One of the problems, and it's a lot of fun when you do this, one of the problems is very frequently none of these were built the way they were supposed to be built. We know that this was supposed to be built with old white cedar, we know they use red because they couldn't get white cedar here. Uh, it was supposed to be painted uh, whitewashed with a red roof with tar on it. They never did it. It fell apart in a couple of years. They did at least paint this red so it could be seen. So as part of that display, and we've, we've actually done this presentation and had the display uh, out at Fire Island Lighthouse. We've done it for a couple of libraries. We've done it uh, at various town buildings. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the displays that is available from the town historian's office. And this happens to be the flag of the life-saving service as well as their symbol. So it's another way to take and bring history alive.
which we really need to do because people can see how people lived on the beach. Yeah, and this is the birth of the Coast Guard, pretty much. Yes, it the is. The Life Saving Station merged with the Revenue Cutter Service, and then that became the Coast Guard. Yes, and I, I paid him to say that, so because I'm a Coast Guard officer. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Do that Coast all Guard time. advertisement. <laughs> yeah, if you have what it takes, take the Coast Guard. <laughs> the answer to four, do we have anybody who tried this one? You have somebody that said A. Yes. A, wood fences. One of the issues in Islip that faced them after they finally joined the United States six years after the uh, formation of the United States uh, was that the British had cut down every tree in the town to use for firewood in Manhattan, and they would they would take ships out and uh, ship it out by boat because you couldn't take it over land because there really weren't any decent roads. Mm. Um, so there wasn't much in the way of trees. So what they did was, after the revolution, they had a lot of saplings, and they would take the saplings and split them and push them down into the ground to root them, and they would create these uh, locked tree fences, which then they would allow all sorts of briars and everything else to grow up in. And basically, uh, the, the hedgerows, anybody who's familiar with military history, the hedgerows in Normandy, this is where they got the idea. Mm -hmm. and, and they would hedge their fields this way and de demark between farms. Uh, and it would be a challenge even to the pigs of Islip to get through this one. So uh, some of these trees still exist. There is a few in the Bayport area. There are supposedly some in the Southside Sportsman's Club. Unfortunately, we lost the one in Oakdale uh, only recently which was a beautiful example, but locked trees, B. Washington spent quite a bit of time in his, uh, in his uh, diary as he went through Long Island. He had also mentioned that Islip had the worst soil he'd ever seen. Some of you who are gardeners probably would agree with him. Um, and, but he did go ahead and mention these locked trees because he thought it was a novel solution to a, a serious problem. Here's question five. Question five. What was one of Islip's town's most valuable crops in the 19th century? Is it A, pigs, B, corn, C, salt hay, or D, fruit? Okay, this is the part, part six. This is the town seal unpleasantly the town of Islip's rebus. So going forward, we're going to be explaining how the town further developed and made their town seal. And it actually still, uh, a lot of it is true to this day. And from the motto, it just holds true deep through ice of town roots. So I'm going to read an actual letter from Sela R. Clock Esquire, who was the clerk of the town of Islip. And it was written from October the 12th of 1883. He goes on to say, Dear Sir... The seal that I have designed and now present to the town of Islip has a significance that can be appreciated by all who are conversant with the history of the town. The branch on the upper portion represents Smithtown, given by Windanch, Sachin of Montauk, to Lion Gardner in 1659. Sold to Richard Smith in 1663, patented to him in 1665. The creeping vines with rootlets at the upper or north end represent on the right Brookhaven, patented in 1666 and through 1686. On the left, Huntington, patented from the same time, 1666 through 1686. The tendency of the rootlets is to creep towards the branch of Smithtown, while the growth southward of the vines is to entwine and embrace the cluster or bunch of grapes, which represents the several patents and necks of land in the territory called Islip. The eye is the mark of vigilance and refers to a remark by Colonel Treadwell Scudder, who was supervisor from 1795 to 1796 and 1804 to 1815, that it was an eye slip on the part of Brookhaven and Huntington and not included in their patents to the territory now called Islip. The date, 1683, refers to the first purchase by William Nichol granted November 29, 1683, and the motto that upholds all of Islip 
which was Fide Sed Qui Vide, which is from memorial bearings of the Nickel family, and it signifies trust, but look out in whom, or more fully translated, have confidence, but be careful in whom you confide. This motto should ever guide in the choice of the town officers with sincerest regards by A.G. Thompson. So as you can see from the above, it points to each section of how that was written by him, what each was representing, and how it signified and symbolized every part of what Islip is and as we know it today. Yeah, if you look carefully at the original, uh, it's not as clear today that there were, there's like these slips, I slip, so it is a rebus, and it, they, they take it from a Thomas I slip who was a, uh, an abbot in England who signed his name. In fact, in uh, uh, Westminster Abbey, there's a carving with his, uh, an I and a slip in it. But they took that, and of course, with the discussion of Colonel Treadwell Scudder, the other towns were supposed to go shore to shore. Islip wasn't supposed to exist, but because of the people it did. One thing to point out, everybody asks, why isn't Babylon on there? Well, Babylon doesn't even exist till 1872, <laughs> when uh, <clears throat> what we think some of the members of the town of Islip, to get even with Huntington for some of the shenanigans that were pulled over the 19th century in court, it looks as if some of them happily helped the secession of the lower section, what was known as South Huntington, from Huntington. Um, over here, Huntington actually has roots on it because Huntington did have a legitimate claim. They just lost most of it in court. They did get some of it. So, again, town seal. We love to show this thing because where other towns have these great colonial roots, ours is our history. It's Islip. And uh, it also makes fun of all the surrounding towns. Question five. The answer is C. Salt, Salt hay. hay. Salt hay. I Do really we have anybody that sense. provided um, the answer prior? Because I don't see anything. No, not that I see. Okay. Yeah, it's Salt Hay. They made a big deal about Salt Hay mm -hmm. because uh, it was it was a crop, and that's one of the reasons they were fighting with uh, for with Huntington over the Salt Hay grounds, which Huntington wanted because it was an extremely valuable bedding and uh, feeding crop. Where can you get more information? In a minute, we're going to answer some any questions that came in. Mm -hmm. We uh, There are 335th anniversary books from the last year or so uh, online at the Town of Islip website uh, under the history section. Uh, you can contact us at 631-595-3862 and leave us a message, or if we're there, we'll answer. Chris is usually there. Uh, in a few weeks, we hope to have a beginning of a series of uh, PowerPoints in MPG4 format, which you can watch online, which will take specific documents and dig into them, and we have a lot of them coming. Uh, and some of the things we covered tonight will be covered in there also. We have displays available. Boy, do we have a lot of those. And uh, talks on the very unique history of a very unique town uh, founded quite by accident, and just because everybody hung together, they managed to defeat the, the crown, the federal government, the state government, the county government, and all the surrounding towns. And one of the kicks of this is somebody who tried to figure out how William Nickel could control all of this land around him. It was really simple. He had daughters, and he married them off to many of the large holders, and what land he didn't hold, his daughters controlled. So William Nickel never lost an election. He was kicked out one year because he didn't live where he ran for office, but that's another story for another night. Your questions. All right, so we had the question on how did Seville get its name, and we also had another question, are these blogs going to be put on video for future viewing? And I believe after this is done, it's going to be on there. I, I believe Their this Facebook is... Facebook page, so you can review it and watch from yeah, the beginning. Yeah, I, I believe this is, and as I said, we are going to be coming up with, for instance, uh, uh, we mentioned the first town minutes. I, it's uh, 32 minutes, so we're going to have to divide it in half. Yes, we definitely have, look forward to our ones that we'll be posting on our website. We've got one on a school teacher's license, which talks about early Islip uh, schools. Mm -hmm. There are some interesting features in that. And uh, the, the next one that's done is on the town seal, an in-depth look at the town seal, which you got 
kind of a smothering over. By the way, these are the these are the people of the town clerk's office who have put all of this stuff together and preserved it over all the years. And uh, let's let's now answer that. You, you have the one other question. We had how Sable got its name. How did Sable get its name? Yeah. All right. Apparently, and there's a number of different stories on this, but uh, I kind of like this one, which is that the postmaster sent it in, and I think one person said it was supposed to be Seville, somebody else said it was supposed to be Seville, but apparently he couldn't spell right. And uh, yeah, I know Wes Sable's version was they were supposed to be Greenville, but as it was pointed out by the federal government, there was already a Greenville post office, so they couldn't use that. They decided not to use Tuckertown, so they became West Sable. How did Sable get in there? We understand it. They, he put it in wrong. It was supposed to be Seville, but it came out Sable. And again, spelling, even back in the, in the well, like we said, 19th yeah. century, wasn't that bad. Good. And if you look at some of these, these people were very well educated. The person who was everything in town was not a dummy. It just that, you know, Again, we live, we live in an era where we worry about spelling, we worry about grammar, we worry about punctuation, and they literally had none of this. Yeah. Now, we have tremendous numbers of documents from town, in the town archives and in archives all over the uh, state from John Wood, who was uh, the school teacher and everything else and also a town official. By the way, as we learned in our early education thing, it was not out of the ordinary for a school teacher to also be a town official, either appointed or elected, because you couldn't live in a school teacher's salary. So they had to come up with something else. So they were postmasters, and, mm -hmm. and they wound up doing about five or six other things. I know the Sable Historical Society has a much more in-depth version of this, but again, and, and I could be corrected, but this is what I've gotten over all the years, and what we can find the little is in the town archives, because the only thing the town kept records of is the voting. And, in case you were worried, we voted for Millard Fillmore. <laughs> yeah, going back to what you said on the spelling, which a lot of the ways that people spelt was through sounding it out or phonetically. So that's why we've noted numerous times William Nickel was spelt the last name noted in the records to three different ways. One with one L, with another E, I believe, and then with the two L's, which is the standard one. Right, and different sections of the family also changed their yes. names. It's just the way that you would heard it was the way that they thought it was spelt. And there's a lot of exciting things that happen. We get inquiries from all over the world. We're working on a research project on a group of um, fishermen from Sweden who apparently came here and lived in Islip to, we're not sure which fishing industry they were involved with, but we're tracking them down. Uh, we just got a, a call from California from a woman who is a descendant of the nickel through his second wife, and we were lucky enough to have the information to pass on to her, the confirmed material that they, they couldn't confirm. So um, you never know what's gonna crop up, and, and Chris Chris uh, spends a lot of his time, we're producing, what is it, we're over, we're almost 7,000, we're close to there, wasn't it, 6,600 yeah, or something? Yeah, it's something, it's quite large. The main spreadsheet has over 5,000 numbers, but that's just the main spreadsheet. When we dive in and we separate it by box by box, there's more numbers going on in that. So it's definitely over 6,000. Hopefully, <laughs> COVID kind of got in the way of a lot of this stuff, but within a few months, we hope to have the first version of an online ability to research and see what we might have in the town archives and and, and eventually they'll reopen and people can come in and, and we will be happy to help them and you can make a point you could make appointments once we are open to the public which we are not now yes. due to COVID. Don't get discouraged. Don't let COVID beat us. Yes. But we would be happy if you if you need to contact us and we had the phone number up earlier. Mm -hmm. um, five uh, five nine five thirty eight sixty two. I'm, I'm get getting it. it right, yes. Uh, 631 area code or you can contact us through historian at islipny.gov and we'll help you if we can if we can't we'll send you to some place that might be able to yes and and Charlene is going to spend her time making sure that everything's in an archival box 
everything is away from bugs and, and mold. You betcha. Yep. So, there's, is there any other questions? Any comments? Uh, not your right. Well, I think we should maybe wait a minute or two. See if we've right. got another question. We'll see if you have any more questions. It's, it, we, uh, we've never done this outside of our own area. We've done everything on our, right, inside uh, 401. So we're working with not only our equipment, but their equipment. So it's been fun setting up and, and making sure everything worked. Yeah, it's, it's never easy. <laughs> they say it's easy. There's always a hiccup. But that's the beauty, just like this, his, looking for these through these archives and looking through these records and finding all these things, it's it's quite fun. And you get to piece out, like we've said, you get to piece out little pieces of Islip Town history and how people were getting along, how people were living, what they were cooking. The recipe book was by far one of our greatest finds just because knowing what they were making and what they were cooking was just amazing. Oh, uh, George, we got um, a question here. Oh boy. And I think it's something that you, um. Uh, You've been uh, helping people with before. It's a uh, question from uh, Barbara Bishop. She uh, grew up at Isa Village. How can I find out the original owners of her home? All right, we, we did a program here on, on that. How can you, first thing, we do have some assessment books. We also have some buildings that if they were, if they're on the state uh, uh, Register of historic sites. There's a state inv excuse me, inventory of historic sites, and there's a large number of them. We do have those in there. We have some of uh, some records of the building. Sometimes that tells us who applied for a building permit over the years. Um, my best, you know, as far as land records go, or uh, deeds and so forth. That in New York State, unlike the rest of the country. In New York State, that falls under the county because that's considered a court record. Uh, we, the towns, are responsible for vital records, tax records, because the town, while it doesn't charge the taxes other than the town tax, all school taxes and all, the town has to collect them and distribute them under state law. So we have some of those records uh, back in time. But what I would suggest is give us a call or send us an email uh, at historian at islipny.gov and we'll see what we can come up with. Be and oh, always include the lot, block, and section number because half yeah, of our documents are addresses. That makes it so much easier. If you know the specific lot, block, and section, we can actually triangulate and get a ton of information on the house if it was historic or a, a, and if it, sorry, if it is a historic property, we may even have an address, but yeah. it's always difficult sometimes. Or just if you just have your tax map number. Yes. The entire mm -hmm. tax map number. The entire map tax map number. number definitely would make yeah, yeah. it a lot easier to. One of the things most people do not realize, not only did street names around here change very often. Uh, a great example in West Sable, it didn't change the name of the street, but officially Cherry Avenue in Sable is not an avenue. It's Cherry Street. And if you go to the railroad crossing, it still says Cherry Street. And many official records still call it Cherry Street, which is what it was when it was named. Uh, New York Avenue is supposed to go north and south, and streets tend to go east and west. Uh, but they didn't bother with that in early days. We also have streets that have changed names so often that, that it gets confusing for us because tax maps are different. So sometimes a street address is useless because in early times they didn't even have street addresses. And when they finally gave them, in some places, they just said, choose a number as long as it's larger than your neighbors. So you have some really strange street numberings, and all of a sudden, normal street numbering start depends on when. It was finally the post office took over, and the town took over and regulated how streets were named and how, um, and we do have some records of street. We haven't even looked at those records yet. Uh, that's one of the things. There's, there's thousands of pages that we have not even had a chance to look at. And Chris, I know it's been at this for, was it four years now, three years? Yes. Yes. It's been a while. I started when I was part time, and, and I was given in like 17 hours and, every week. And thanks to thanks to Shirlene, we can actually get in the room. She straightened out the records and put her hands on anything. But yes. uh, like any project, it takes a long work. time. It takes a while, and you need you need a group. 
So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, just, again, get a hold of us on the specifics. Um, we'll leave a message and we'll get back to you. And we'll see what we can come up with. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. All righty. It's been a great evening. And a strange evening because it's hard talking to a wall when there's nobody <laughs> here to react to. Yeah, well, we got Charlene in the back waving her hands. <laughs> um, it, it's, been, it's been a good evening, and uh, we look forward to doing some more of these in the future. Yay. Thank you for having us. Um, hopefully you all enjoyed it.